Welcome everyone to this Montana Book Festival event, Historic Tales of Whoop Up Country of Whoop Up Country on the trail from Montana's Fort Benton to Canada's Fort McCloy. My name is China Reavers. I am a volunteer host for the Montana Book Festival, and I want to welcome you, audience, into this virtual space from Bozeman, Montana. The Montana Book Festival acknowledges that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish Kootenai, Absaloke, and Cheyenne people. The Montana Book Festival strives and will continue to strive to help promote Indigenous voices as one of the ways our organization acknowledges and respects the Aboriginal peoples of Bozeman and across Montana. For those of you zooming in from outside of Montana, I encourage you, or outside of Bozeman, excuse me, I encourage you to take a look at the link I'll put up shortly in the chat so you too know whose Aboriginal territories you're currently occupying. Go ahead and let us know where you're Zooming from this afternoon. We're really excited to welcome Kim Robeson to this year's virtual festival. Excuse my pop, sorry guys. But I want to first take care of a little housekeeping. We'd like to welcome you as attendees to submit your questions to our author via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Please use the chat function to talk amongst yourselves while the event is taking place. And on the back end, I'll be monitoring both the Q&A and chat for any logistical questions you may have throughout the event. The Montana Book Festival also wishes to thank our event sponsors, Arts Missoula, Humanities Montana, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Whitefish Review, and MissoulaEvents.net. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our author. Native Montanan Ken Robeson is historian at the Overholzer Historical Research Center and for the Great Falls Cascade C County Historic Preservation Commission and is active in historic preservation throughout central Montana. He is a retired Navy captain after a career in naval intelligence and the Montana Historical Society honored Ken as Montana Heritage Keeper in 2010. And with that, I'll let Ken get started. Thank you. Well, thank you, China. And good afternoon, Montana Book Festival and Hoop Up Country fans. Last year, 150 years ago, marked the birth of the fort, the trail, and the country that bear the colorful name Hoop Up. It all began in 1869 when the stage was set by the withdrawal of the Hudson Bay Company from their monopoly on Western Canada. For the next 13 years, from 1870 to 1883, until the arrival of the Canadian Pacific Railroad, trade goods, supplies, and uh, travelers all arrived by steamboat to Fort Benton for transfer to overland freight wagons to follow a trail that assumed legendary fame and notoriety. And the trail was only the beginning. It led directly to the settlement of the prairie provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan with Montana businessmen like I.G. Baker and Tom and John Power helping form today's cities of Lethbridge, Calgary, and, and uh, Fort McLeod. Montana ranchers like Charlie Conrad and Howell Harris helped begin the great Canadian cattle industry. Montana and Anna Armstrong even brought the first dairy herd to Fort McLeod. Simply heard, Fort Hoop Up and Hoop Up Country and its aftermath led directly to today's great shared history between Montana and the Canadian Prairie Provinces. So here are the two great trails we'll be talking about. The Ripplinger Trail heads north from Sun River Crossing through Blackfeet Country, but more on that later. And the other trail to the east from Fort Benton into southern Canada is the Hoop Up Trail. From Fort Benton, that trail follows the Mullen Road west before heading northwest across the Teton River at Captain Nels's Crossing and on to the northwest past the Knees, across the Marias River past today's Shelby onto the west of Three Buttes, that is today's Sweetgrass Hills, across the unmarked international boundary, better known then as the Medicine Line, and onto the Belly River near today's Lethbridge. 
hoop up country formed along the trail that passed through the broad rolling prairie lands between Fort Benton north, northward into the newly formed Canadian Northwest Territory. The hoop up trail became the first international highway in the Northwest and Fort, Fort Benton became the birthplace of hoop up country. John J. Healy was on a mission of revenge as he left his Sun River trading post and crossed the medicine line in early January, 1870. Next slide, please. Revenge because he and other Fort Benton friends had been badly treated by the Hudson Bay Company some years before. Healy and his partner, Al Hamilton, were the first Fort Benton free traders to lead an expedition into the new Northwest Territory. This bold undertaking broke the fur and robe trading monopoly of the mighty Hay Hudson Bay Company, which for two centuries had been absolutely dominant in Rupert's land from Great Slave Lake in the present to the present Montana northern boundary line, and even across into modern Montana with posts like Fort Kana. Thus began the hoop up era a new period in the transnational history of Northern Montana and the Prairie Provinces of Canada, an era that would open up new settlements and only end with the arrival of that Canadian Pacific Railroad. Yet our shared heritage lives on today. Adventurer John Healy, his partner Al Hamilton, and 11 wagons departed Healy's Sun River trading post at Sun River Crossing in secrecy with mild weather, weather from Chinook winds just after Christmas on December 28, 1869 on their epic journey northward. If you've driven Highway 200 from Missoula to Great Falls, you may, may recognize this little white house on the north bank of the Sun River, just over the bridge. This was the site of Johnny Healy's trading post and thus has and this little white house has logs from Healy's trading post embedded in its walls today. I might add that here at this trailing post, an ailing General Thomas Francis Marr spent a week regaining enough help, health to proceed on to Fort Benton to meet an arms shipment from the federal arsenal only to lose his bold and dashing life in the June rise of the Missouri River at Benton, but that's another story. The expedition had 14 men, including Johnny Healy, partner Al Hamilton, Black Teamster Bob Mills, Mexican Spanish Joe Arana, and two biracial Black fit Foot Hunters, Jerry Potts and George Starr. Along with them, during the final part of the journey, were members of the Kainai Blood Blackfoot, adding not only protection, but also confirmation that Healy's trading expedition enjoyed approval of the Kainai, whose historic territory was their destination. Following the Lip Ripplinger Trail that you saw earlier on the map, the party moved slowly, trading along the way traveling 160 miles over a three week period before arriving by January 17th, 1870 at the mouth of the confluence of the St. Mary's River where it joined the Billy River just south of today's Lethbridge. These were dangerous <laughs> times for just a week after this, the Marias massacre occurred with the US Army under Major Eugene Baker striking Pagan Blackfeet Heavy Runners Winter Camp. Healy's expedition immediately began to cut down trees to begin constructing a trading post. Their first crude fort provided both trading and living quarters for the men. It was christened Fort Hamilton and winter trade began with the Kainai Blackfoot resident in the area. While most of the men were engaged in building the trading post, Healy and Hamilton with several Kainai searched for the highly influential Kainai chief, many spotted horses at his winter camp near the Belly River. After giving gifts to the chief, Healy received a winter wife thought to be a daughter of the chief. Critically, Healy received permission to build 
their trading post among the Kainai. The shocking tragedy at Pakuni South Pagan Heavy Runners Winter Camp on the Mariah side emphasize again, happened just one week after Healy and Hamilton arrived at the Belly River. Recall also that Healy's expedition had met a party of 20 Kainai under Buffalo Bulls Backfat, a hereditary chief with powerful standing. These Kainai appreciated the food they'd received because they'd been short on supplies and couldn't find Buffalo and they'd urged Healy and Hamilton to continue on to build a post for trading in Kainai country. Before the stockade was finished, hundreds of Pakuni South Pagan under the leadership of Cut Hand approached. They were bent on revenge for the recent massacre and planned to kill the Euro-American traders after trading with them. A warning came from the Kainai, quote, Cut Hand is here. He will trade only for powder and ball. When he gets enough, he will kill you white men, unquote. Healy's men retreated to the partially completed fort and prepared for the worst. Kainai chief Bull's back fat arrived on scene and declared, friends, you know the white soldiers a short time ago cleaned out the Pagan camp over on the Marias. There were no warriors in the camp for it was just a sick camp. And the able-bodied men were out hunting for meat for their wives, babies, and old people. The white soldiers came in the night and slaughtered the sick old men and women, the mothers and babies as they slept, or hunted them down in the snow and killed them. The hearts of all the Blackfoot, the Pagans, and Bloods are filled with bitterness against whites for this. Cut Hand and his Pagans have come to kill you. But you men have been kind to us, and you are our traitors. We Bloods were hungry when you met us and fed us, we are grateful. Now 500 of my warriors have joined our party. The Pagans will have to kill us before they kill you. They outnumber us greatly, but they are our cousins, and I don't believe they will force us to fight. If they do, we will die fighting with you white men. Open the door and look out. With this action, the Kainai took defensive positions around the stockade. Al Hamilton opened the door of the trading room and saw the fort completely surrounded by Kainai warriors stripped for fighting. Chief Bull's back fat stepped out and addressed the Pagans assembled around, signing for them to start the trade. They lined up every man carrying weapons of some sort and each one accompanied by a woman or two laden with furs and buffalo robes. The Kainai chief admitted only two at a time to trade at the fort. Instead of the usual barter of furs and robes for cloth, <clears throat> blankets, tobacco, beads, calico, and other trade articles used by the natives, the Pagans all threw down their robes and demanded powder and lead. The white men gave them at first 40 rounds of powder and ball for each robe. But as the supply of ammunition dwindled, they cut down to 20 rounds and finally to 10. They expected a protest, but none was made. The last to trade was Cut Hand, the Pagan chief. And as he finished, the white men saw the crisis was at hand. It was for as the Pagan chief started out the door, Buffalo Bill Bulls back fat stopped him and said, you have finished trading with these white men. Now you go and go peacefully. You've come to kill these white men. You'll have to kill me and my men first. If I find out that later you molest these friends of mine, I will attack your camps. You will be the first I will kill. Cut hands stalked out of the fort and briefly ordered his band to break camp and start north. It took two and a half hours for them to pass in procession. After they'd gone, the white traders started cooking a feast for the bloods and they made merry with that feast. They'd taken in 1600 buffalo robe and many furs and elks in this trade. Bull's back fat 
kept the peace and the traitors and Fort Hamilton were saved. Fort Hamilton crude and just a beginning was underway. And that first trading winter proved a huge financial success with some with something like $1 million in today's dollars taken in trade. Fort Hamilton was burned in the spring after the winter trade. And the photo that you're seeing shows the more elaborate successor for the winter of 1870-71, the following winter. And this was built by William Gladstone and his crew of Métis. Gladstone was an ancestor of today's Blackfeet Balladeer Jack Gladstone, and the name soon changed to Fort Hoopa. <clears throat> there are many tales about how Fort Hamilton became Fort Hoopa, but my favorite involves colorful, larger than life trader Charles Choquette, who freighted from Fort Benton to Fort Hamilton. Choquette didn't know much English, and whenever he learned a word, he had a habit of repeating it over and over. There was an 80-mile barren stretch between Fort Benton and Fort Hamilton and was a dread to the outfits that made the trip. One night, Choquette was drawing near to the fort, his outfit tired and lagging, and the men were complaining, including Charlie himself. Finally, one bush bullwhacker said, let's hoop it up and get to the fort. This struck Charlie as a good phrase and he kept repeating it over and over. And as his train neared the fort, he yelled out hoop up and Fort Hoop Up became a fixture. Through the bold actions of Healy and Hamilton, Fort Benton free traders had pried open the door to the former Rupert's land. Into this vacuum poured hundreds of Montana traders and freighters, opening more than 40 trading posts north of the medicine line, posts bearing striking names like Hoop Up, Slide Out, and Standoff. The story of Standoff involves a battle of wit and will between trader Joe Kipp and Deputy U.S. Marshal Charles Hard. Kip was determined to move whiskey in secrecy from Helena to a new trading post he was going to establish north of the medicine line. Kip slipped out of Helena and loaded his whiskey on a sturdy raft to float down the Missouri River to today's Great Falls at, at the mouth of the Sun River. There, the whiskey with other trade goods was loaded on a freight train, and Kip and his men started the long trip north. Marshal Hard eventually picked up the trail and rode hard to overtake Kip. Several days later, just after crossing the North Fork of the Milk River, Kip looked back and saw a lone horseman coming at, up the trail fast. It's the marshal, said Kip, and right here's where we stand him off. Hard rode past the first and second wagons without stopping, pulling up at the third, which Kip was driving at the time. Well, Joe, he said with a grin, I've got you at last. Just turn around and head for Benton. Hard, you're just 20 minutes late, replied Kip. You should have overtaken us before we crossed the North Fork back there. Come on, the marshal insisted. No fooling. This is serious business. So turn your teams around. You have no authority here, returned Kip, for on this spot we are in Canada. The North Fork of the Milk River, a mile back, is the line. Hard was so taken aback that he couldn't speak for a moment. The international boundary line had not been surveyed or marked. No one knew exactly where the monuments would eventually stand, but it was generally believed that Chief Mountain and the North Fork of the Milk River were on or very close, one way or the other, to the 49th degree of North Latitude, which constituted the boundary line. Hard finally said, you have no proof that we are in Canada. I'll take a chance on being south of the line. I arrest you all 
for having liquor in your possession in Indian country. Kip laughed. You have no proof that we're not north of the line. We'll take a chance that we are in Canada and there are five of us and one of you. Right here, we stand you off. Hard argued and threatened, but his words were wasted and he had no doubt realized the weakness of his position. He suddenly wheeled his horse and rode back down the trail. Later, when the line was finally surveyed, the spot where he'd tried to make the arrest was found to be 300 yards just south of the line. No image has survived of Fort Standoff, but this is Joe Kipp's later post, Fort Kipp also north of the medicine line. While most traders and bullwhackers moving into hoop up country were Euro-Americans, they were joined by many Métis as well as several Mexican and African-Americans. Black men, including Philip Barnes, James Van Lithberg, Henry Mills and William Bond had long worked for the American Fur Company. Bond became the first free trader arrested and jailed after the arrival of the Northwest Mounted Police. Henry Mills, hunter, trapper, blood tribal member, and renowned bullwhacker was called Six Apequan or Black White Man by the Kainai. Colin Thompson in his study of black pioneers in Canada wrote in two languages, the, illustri Ill the illiterate Miles Mills coaxed, cajoled and cussed the plodding oxen as few others could. Certainly unique among Hoopup's black residents was Molly Smith, AKA McLean. Freed from slavery on a Missouri plantation, Molly had come up the Missouri River to Fort Benton about 1868. By the mid 19, 1870s, Molly had moved north of the border to the new town of Fort Walsh, where she joined the small black community and operated a laundry with, while possibly dabbling in bootlegging, bootlegging by smuggling whiskey in a special com leather compartment built into her brassiere. The times were often brutally harsh as the Montana Canadian weather, yet both Montanans and Canadians have tended to exaggerate for dramatic effect, the traders, the whiskey posts, the hooping it up environment. After all, neither the reconstructed Fort Hoop Up near Lethbridge nor the reconstructed old Fort Benton trading post would be quite as exciting as tourist attractions and have quite their luster without the hoop up stories, sometimes per portrayed accurately, other times to the extreme, especially by Canadian historians. Similarly, most writing of the era, era has come from Canadians and they emphasize to the extreme indig indigenous people and white conflict from minor skirmishes to major battles as the cultures clashed. Yet the continuing conflicts of historic enemies such as Blackfoot Cree and Blackfoot Assiniboine, the Nakota, leading to horse capture raids, captive women, skirmishes, battles, and even that glamorous word massacres happened on occasion and yet are little mentioned. In fact, that very year of the Marias massacre, two large scale battles occurred north of the medicine line between the Blackfoot and their historic enemies, the Assiniboine and Cree. A few notes are in order as the tales of hoop up country flow. Many of the stories and words come directly from the colorful pioneer participants in this saga. I've presented unfiltered stories of the hoop up trail the trading posts, the colorful characters, and the frontier times. These are real pioneers speaking in the words of their times, terms that may bother or offend today's reader. Let's not rewrite or erase history, but let's learn from it. Let's understand their environment of clashing cultures and learn from these often tense, sometimes desperate times. The riches 
to be made and the absence of law and order drew a wide mix of humanity, saints and sinners, leading to incidents and conflicts culminating in a battle in the Cypress Hills between Fort Benton Wolfers and North, and North Assiniboine, the Nakota, the so-called Cypress Hills Massacre. Let me read a little about this important Cypress Hills incident and its aftermath. What began as a skirmish ended as a battle and was declared by Canadian authorities a massacre. In April of, 1880, of 1873, a mixed party of eight American and Canadian traders returning from their winter trade in the Northwest Territory camped near Fort Benton. The next morning, victims of a nighttime raid, they discovered their horses stolen by unknown natives. At Fort Benton, the traders sought military assistance from Lieutenant James Bradley and his 7th Infantry Com Company stationed there, part of the regiment at Fort Shaw under Civil War General John Gibbon. Denied military aid, the Wolfers, led by Johnny Evans and Tom Hardwick, departed on a mission to track down and retrieve their stolen horses. Crossing the border into the Cypress Hills, the party tracked the horses to the vicinity of the trading posts of Fort Benton traders, Abe Farwell and Mose Solomon in the Cypress Hills with the nearby camp of Nakota. Over the next few hours, a wild and confusing series of events transpired leaving 20 to 40 natives and one French Canadian, Ed LaGrace, dead. The legend of the Cypress Hills massacre was born, triggering action by the Canadian government to face at last their law and order crisis in the Northwest Territory. Responding to complaints from both sides of the border, the Canadian government in 1873, belatedly formed the Northwest Mounted Police, today's Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and sent them west in the summer of 1874 to establish law and order, close down the whiskey trade, and coerce the free traders back across the border into Montana. The result was lively and surprising. You'll read about the saga of the Great March West as the newly formed Northwest Mounted Police marched overland westward over unmarked and rugged terrain. In fact, the so-called Great March almost became the great disaster before the Mounted Police were rescued by Fort Benton traders. The highest priorities for the Mounted Police on their arrival in the Northwest Territory as they brought law, order, and justice were to, con to conquer Fort Hoopa, shut down the other major forts, suppress the whiskey trade, and impose justice for the Cypress Hills massacre. Arriving at Fort Hoopa, the mounted police expected to face hundreds of heavily armed Montanans in a fierce fight before they seized the whiskey fort's liquor supply. In fact, as they arrived, they found the gate open just six men there, one of them legless cripple, Charles Shaft, who invited the police to join them for a fine dinner. Of course, the booze had already been hidden before their arrival. While their arrival and actions through the winter of 1874-75 led to the very talented, led by the very talented Colonel McLeod, made significant progress in most of these objectives the problem of Cypress Hills remained. As they gathered intelligence and, and identified participants, they discovered that most of those involved were no longer in the territory. By the spring of 1875, the mounted police had formed a plan of action to seek extradition from Montana for most of the sculpers, sculpers to imprison any who could be found on Canadian soil. Through the American federal government, extradition action began. A fascinating participant in the drama that followed was remarkable James T. Stanford, who came west as a mounted policeman and after his discharge married into the merchant prince Conrad family 
and became a major figure in Montana for the rest of his life, including, as shown here, a brigadier general in the Montana National Guard. About a dozen Americans were involved in the Cyprus incident, which occurred in May 1873 in that range of low-lying Cypress Hills just north of the Canadian border. It was two years later that five of these men were brought to trial on an extradition proceeding at Helena, an effort being made at this time to have them extradited and taken to Canada for trial before the mounted police. At about the same time, three others were arrested in Canada and were tried in Winnipeg, charged with murder. The extradition proceedings at Helena failed and the prisoners were released amid a wild celebration at the Montana Capitol. The three tried in Winnipeg were subsequently acquitted because of the fact that their fellows in Montana had been freed. The men tried for extradition at Helena notably included Johnny Evans and Trevian Hale together with one real scoundrel, Tom Hardwick. The extradition trial ended and the prisoners were freed from the threat of extradition to Canada. Helena residents led by Wilbur Fisk Sanders, later US Senator Sanders, turned out in force that night to celebrate the freedom of these five proclaimed Kit Carsons as they prepared to return to Fort Benton. Proceeding on to Fort Benton, the heroes were greeted in triumph by their hometown. The Benton record reported the big celebration included a mass meeting at Solomon's Hall, featuring a drawing of the British lion in full flight with an American eagle biting his tail. A rip roaring speech by Finian Irishman General John J. Donnelly filled with indignation and triumph and a celebratory ball until the wee small hours of the morning. It's worth noting that General John J. Donnelly of Civil War Union Army and Finnish, Finian Irish Army fame, fame had just a few years earlier been a leader in Finian invasions of Canada. We haven't time for General Donnelly and his fiery speech as he condemned the British government as only an Irishman could and welcomed the extradition five home. But very shortly after, Johnny Evans brought, bought one of the saloons on Front Street in Fort Benton and opened the extradition saloon. Over the decades that followed, memories of the wild and woolly hoop up era flowed forth in pioneer reminiscences and historical articles on both sides of the border. The nasty low life whiskey traders emerged in reality as exceptional frontiersmen like Howell Harris, Charles E. Conrad, Donald W. Davis, leading players in the settlement of the Canadian West. For every scoundrel, there were dozens of men of talent and ability. Scoundrels like Tom Hardwick were vastly outnumbered by future leaders of Canada and Montana, including seven later sheriffs of Shoto County. Yet over time, stories of Hoop Up Trail and its era faded in the public mind. Memories of the trail, this great international avenue of trade and commerce with its shared lifeline and culture from our past, flickers rightly at times on both sides of the medicine line as it did in this 1935 edition of the Lethbridge Herald. Small towns along the trail have raised awareness on occasion by promoting stories or events. And the Conrad High School even exchanged letters with Charlie Russell about the Hoop Up Trail and brought out its high school yearbook, still to this day named the Hoop Up Trail. And for the past 80 years, the town of Conrad has held an annual Hoop Up Trail Days celebration each summer. Both Lethbridge and Fort Benton have held joint celebrations for dedication of trail markers or hoop up historical pageants. While the memories have faded, the shared bonds remain to this day. Bonds with Canada and memories of the hoop up trail 
rose during August 17 years ago when I joined 14 other members of the Fort Benton River and Plains Society uh, to travel north, not along the hoop up trail exactly, but along modern highways across a now well-defined and marked medicine line to Lethbridge to visit the new and tour reconstructed Fort Hoop Up. The Fort Benton group symbolically representing free traders and led by executive director, John G. Lepley was hosted at a breakfast and given a special tour by Fort Hoop Up director, Doran Dagenstein and historian, Gord Tolton. More events followed at Fort McLeod, including the dedication of a new Royal Canadian Mounted Police Barracks and a performance by the famed Mounted Police Musical Ride. I took this photo on that trip, showing Jack Lepley with Bob Dirk admiring the Fort Benton Cannon that had been taken by Johnny Healy from Fort Benton to Fort Hoop Up in 1870 and was probably at Fort Hoop Up when the Mounted Police arrived. Last year on the 150th anniversary, our Overholzer Historical Research Center presented a display tribute to Hoop Up Country at the entrance to the Montana State Agricultural Museum. And Fort Benton planned to commemorate Hoop Up during the annual summer celebration on this 150th year. But then COVID struck, canceling summer celebration events and even closing the medicine line so we didn't have Canadian visitors joining us. We're still waiting for that to happen. This year, Fort Benton is celebrating its 175th anniversary in summer celebration, celebration festivities as they resumed, yet again without Canadian visitors. Two months ago on August 24th, we were once more reminded of our shared history this on the occasion of the visit of more than two dozen leaders, chiefs and elders from the Blackfoot Confederacy. It's important to note that three of the four Blackfoot nations reside north of the medicine line in Alberta, yet they came on this 175th anniversary of Fort Benton to pay tribute to the town the Blackfoot call many homes to the south. Among the many tributes, Kainai chief Roy Fox and others spoke eloquently about their shared pride. So here's to the colorful Johnny Healy who started the whole thing to our shared history with our indigenous neighbors and the Canadian Prairie provinces and a hoop up country as we hoop them up at 150 years. And we can't possibly end without a shout out to artist Annie Th Andy Thompson who allowed me to use his lively painting, A Hot Time in Old Fort Benton. And he painted this scene from an event that occurred in Fort Benton during the 1865 Blackfoot Treaty signing there. Johnny Healy and his friends loaded a mountain howitzer, perhaps the one I showed you earlier, on the back of a mule. Healy's match ignited not only the fuse, but also the mule as it began reacting violently to the actions on its back, sending the treaty crowd scattering in every direction. With that, I thank you and the leaders of our great Montana tradition, the book festival. Let's hope that we're together live next year at this event. I'd be pleased to take some questions, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Ken. It doesn't look like we have any questions in the Q&A from our attendees, but I hope that they do have any. Um, we still have time to answer them, so please feel free to submit them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, Ken, just you shared so much information <laughs> today, and I can't imagine how much more is in the novel. What are the greatest challenges that you face as a historian and in the work that you do in procuring um, like different materials? I want, of course, I, 
I deal in a wide range of history at the uh, research center in Fort Benton, of course. Um, I mean, we have uh, fans of, of the beloved faith, faithful dog Shep all over the world, uh, uh, sending queries for photos or for information. A Russian dog magazine asked for photos to use in an article about Shep in the Soviet Union. This was back when it was the Soviet Union. Uh, we had an uh, Australia writer who's working on a book. And so, I mean, Shep is, is popular. Steamboats, that whole 30 year era of steamboats coming all the way from St. Louis to the upper Missouri. This is just an unbelievable story. So there's so many stories related to that. There are stories related to, to the more recent arrivees in Montana, the homesteaders in the early 1900s and so it, it's a very wide range, but when you get back into the 1800s, especially early in our uh, Euro-American presence in the 1860s and 70s, uh, primary sources can be a, a problem. Uh, it, it's also, uh, you know, in, in today's language and today's uh, terminology, um, I, I'm a fan of presenting history so that we can learn from it, but, there, but there's a limit to uh, how offensive uh, past writing and past um, articles can, can be to the, to the modern mind. And so, you know, I think that maybe the biggest challenge is, is finding solid primary sources and doing a credible job of presenting the history in and the clashing of cultures and things like that, but presenting it so uh, a modern reader is not offended. Yeah. And what is some of the most exciting um, primary source material that you found in this particular project? So I, I know you work on so much, but well, so many of the uh, of the Euro American participants, the 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 traders, the bullwhackers, and so on, um, left stories. Uh, some of them very brief, some of them quite detailed. And finding those stories and finding insight. Uh, I mean, I found one great story. It was set in Joe Kipp's Fort Kipp that I showed the image of earlier. Um, and, it's, and it is a, a story that tells us the names of uh, all the traders for a couple year period at that fort and what they were buying, what the costs were. Things like that are, I mean, the, those trading posts didn't keep records. You know, the Montana Historical Society doesn't have the business records from Fort Kip and so on. So to find in the newspapers on rare occasions, an article uh, in detail like that one was very good. Also, there's been great work done on the trading posts, these uh, Montana trading posts in Canada, almost, uh, it's more than 40, almost 50 of them, uh, that's been done by um, two Canadian archaeologists, uh, Kennedy and Reeves, and uh, we have the result of their detailed exploration and archaeological work and their gathering of all the history they could locate on those uh, posts uh, in our research center. And I, I summarized the, the information on those posts in the book because uh, that's never been available before. So um, things like that uh, and, and just the whole environment of the time, I think, is, is something we need to understand. Uh, this was key to the settlement of Montana, but it was also key to the settlement of those Canadian prairie provinces. And oh, just there, it's, I am a, I always feel like I need to take a lot of time with history, uh, <laughs> because it's just so rich, and there's so much so many details are intricate. So thinking of questions right now, wanting to make sure that I'm kind of taking my time with everything that you just shared. But when you're putting together, so 
you said this was when you're sorry that I'm all over the place. There's just so much here. That's fine. When you're exploring new subjects to write about, do you pursue these like historical events or like you said, these two um, trading locations, were you drawn to them or did you find material first that led you to them? Like what is your process in approaching um, your historical texts? Uh, yeah, you know, China kind of depends on whether it's more recent history or whether it's uh, early, early history. Um, I, I must say that um, the digitiz digitization of newspapers, that difficult word, digitized newspapers that are available online now are uh, tending to revolutionize historical research. Um, now, Montana's problem is that early, really early newspapers were relatively few in number, and they were at most like four page weekly newspapers. So um, by no means everything that happened in a community or in that part of, of the new territory of Montana was captured in those newspapers. But a, an amazing amount of information, if, if, you, if you search through all the available sources and compile and build, you, you can find a, a really an amazing amount. And, and then it's a matter of, of um, what you, as a historian, I'm concerned about what's credible, what, you know, what looks solid with enough evidence that I can present it as history that I will present. And um, so that's somewhat of a judgment. I mean, according to uh, Stephen La Ambrose, the great Lewis and Clark scholar, everything that ever happened was history. Well, yeah, but it's kind of up to historians to uh, select out from everything that ever happened what they are going to present in the stories they're telling. And I do like stories. I, 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 I'd rather, when I, when I read history, I'd rather read a lot of the words of participants at the time rather than, than a judgment of today's historian rewriting their story in his or her own terms. So. Um, many of my books capture a lot of of that kind of primary source material, the original words, and and that and hoop up is certainly uh, that case. The other thing that I, I'd have to remind everyone is that uh, by no by no means all newspapers are digitized at this point, and and you can't ignore having to go back to the microfilm or even back to hard copy newspapers. Uh, and there are some available where they haven't either been microfilmed or they've been digitized. And, you know, because again, you're, I'm looking for different perspectives on the story, not just one version. I don't believe I have any additional questions. I am looking forward to rewatching this when it is up on our YouTube channel. Um, it will likely be up today. Um, can I ask a question, yeah. Anna? Yes, of course, please. My question is, Ken, what have you done <laughs> since Hoop Up? <laughs> well, I love the way you said, <laughs> Ken. <laughs> Hoop Up is my COVID book. It came out last fall, and uh, there were relatively few places I could uh, share it live with audiences, so I'm back doing that. I was at the Montana Historical Society in Helena about 10 days ago talking about Hoop Up, and I'm going to be doing that elsewhere. But in the meantime, of course, Hoop Up was written, and I had a year or two turn to another subject, which was one that was very close to my heart because I, I'd spent 30 years on active duty in the 
Navy and in Naval Intelligence and uh, the, what I, my years in the Navy from 1960 to 1990 were the heart of the Cold War era. And so in the past year I've put together and it just came out about 10 days ago, uh, Cold War Montana. And in that I tell the story of the Cold War but I tell it through the voices of Montanans, both spread around the world like I was, or in Montana, because so many things were happening in our state during the Cold War that are really notable. And so it, it's going to be great fun taking that book also around. Um, so Cold War Montana is the new, the new one as well. And I just threw the link up for that book, uh, Cold War Montana, uh, Fact and Fiction. I also have the link for Historic Tales of Whoop Up Country on the trail from Montana's Fort Benton to Canada's Fort McCloyd in the chat. I do see a couple of questions. Um, actually, yeah, we have a couple of questions. Sorry, I missed these. They're both from Nancy Silliman. And the first question is, were there any African-Americans making an appearance on the Whoop Up Trail? Um, and I'll let you answer that one before I bring the- Absolutely. The you know, too, for too long, African-Americans were left out of the writing of Montana history. And since I returned from my Navy career to Montana, I, I looked for what, what was neglected in Montana history. And it was bell clear to me that uh, ethnic history, but especially black history had been ignored and left out. So every one of my books uh, it includes participation by African-Americans, whether it's my World War I books or the Civil War books or the uh, Cold War new book. But in the case of uh, Hoop Up Country, there were a handful of African-Americans working for the American Fur Company as early as like the 1840s and 50s. So in Fort Benton, there was a presence that early. Uh, during the 18, early 1870s, you know, a little later, uh, many more African-Americans were coming up on steamboats after the Civil War many could work on steamboats. Some of them settled after they'd come up working on steamboats. And there were uh, some of the great uh, bullwhackers uh, involved in the overland freighting. You know, we talk about the, the uh, uh, exciting steamboat days. Well, the other half of that was the, the steamboats brought thousands and thousands of tons of, of cargo to the Fort Benton levee. But it didn't just sit there. There had to be hundreds and hundreds of wagons and oxen and mules and mule skinners and bullwhackers, those guys that loaded that freight and headed in every direction to the mining camps and certainly on up, on up the hoop up trail to the trading posts in Canada. And the, and some of the most prominent, like uh, um, the... Uh, uh, the ones I mentioned uh, earlier in the talk, uh, Mills and Bond and so on, were uh, African Americans involved in the in the hoop up country and hoop up trade. Others were, uh, I mean, settled, uh, intermarried with black Blackfoot wives or other Native wives, and uh, uh, have you know had a presence in, in around. Uh, different parts of Montana. So yes, there was definitely an African-American presence in the hoop up trade. Another question? Yeah, and then the other question from Nancy was decades ago, there was a book entitled Hoop Up Country. How is your book different? There was a very good, Sharp was the name of the author. It came out in the 1950s. It's a very good academic book. Uh, it, uh, it, it's, it's from the 1950s and it reads like it. Excellent book, uh, but 
Uh, mine is uh, uh, stories by the participants and it has uh, a great many photos. You, you, can, you can pick mine up and have, I think, a much more uh, visual experience with the Hoop Up Country because you're seeing photos of the participants and photos of the places and things. So, um, uh, and it's a 70 year later production with, uh, I think uh, I found things that weren't in that, but it, it, it still was a very credible book. And there've been several other small pamphlets and things put out over time on Hoop Up, but uh, this, this one is a, a good fresh approach. Great. I'm not seeing any other questions. I'm just double checking, but I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. And I've got to ask you, Ken, are there any other questions you have for yourself that you would <laughs> like to share with us? I love that you did. <laughs> I love that you asked the question instead of just. I, I, I've got another great question and that is. Perfect. There, there are, you know, there are resources around Montana, uh, small museums and historical societies, and then there's some really big ones. I'm a new member of the Board of Trustees of the Montana Historical Society, our great Montana, uh, I mean, the collection they have in terms of Montana's history is absolutely stunning and amazing. And uh, we're in the process with the help of the Montana legislature and also from a lot of uh, private donations and we need more, but uh, we're building the Montana Heritage Center, which will more than double the, the size of the space that we have both to present Montana history to the people of Montana, as well as to Canadians of visit or people are from uh, all over the world and country that are interested in, in Montana history. And it, you'd be surprised, as, for instance, um, Carl Bodmer, an Austrian artist came up the Missouri River in 1832-33 with uh, Prince Maximilian of Weed and captured the environment before it, there was any real Euro-American presence. And, and their, Bodmer's art is mass, masterful in presenting the way the, nation, the Native American nations were and the environment and everything. And I guess what I'm saying is that, um, we have a huge following in Germany and Europe in Montana history that dates all the way back to that Carl Bodmer expedition. And we have uh, visitors every year from Germany coming to Fort Benton and coming to other parts of Montana. And I'd emphasize again how important the Canadian presence in Montana is every summer and throughout the year, but especially in the summer, Towns like Great Falls and Fort Benton count at least 25% of the trade um, on Canadian visitors, sometimes as high as a, a third of the trade. And the small towns from Great Falls North are very heavily dependent. So getting that border reopened in November is, is getting back to normal for our shared heritage with the Canadians. It's, it's the impact of COVID has just continued, I think, for far longer than any of us anticipated last year, you know, at the beginning of 2020. And we are looking forward to that shared connection with Canada again soon, hopefully. And I also did share the link for the Montana Heritage Center, which looks like it plans to open in 2024, 2025. Um, so that looks like an amazing endeavor by the Montana Historical Society. And I'm looking forward to seeing it in our community. And I really appreciate all the work that you do with that, Ken, so. Thank you, Joanna. Yeah, and then last, last call. <laughs> last call is 
whether you have homesteaders that came in the early 1900s in the great homestead boom or immigrants that came much earlier or whether you have shared native american and white um, ancestry uh, we we have a constant uh, stream of visitors and queries at our research center in fort benton the overholzer historical research center and we enjoy putting the cultures together and it's it's a it, it's a blessing to be able to uh, know the recent generations, for instance, from the Blackfeet Reservation at Browning and the earlier generations before they came to Montana that our research can often help with to uh, for, for the families with names like Weatherwax and Evanses and all the uh, mixed marriages that there occurred during the fur trade era and since then for that matter but um, research can be fun history can be magic thank you i love that research can be fun history can be magic i think those are wonderful words to end on thank you to ken robeson and thank you to everyone watching and participating you've been great Thank you also to our event sponsors, Arts Missoula, Humanities Montana, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Whitefish, Resu Whitefish Review, and MissoulaEvents.net. Just as a reminder, you can purchase books by Ken at Fact and Fiction Books. Be sure to enter the code MBF when you check out on their website, factandfictionbooks.com, or you can vocally say the code MBF if you're buying books in store. Links to both of Ken's books are in the chat. I also urge you to purchase Montana Book Festival merchandise at montanabookfestival.com. There you can also donate so that, you, so that we can continue our programming after the festival this year. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Ken. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.